Ready? Can you all hear me okay? We are so excited to welcome you here this evening um, with Karen Koontz and Ray Muniz and John Hitchcock to have some really lovely conversation, but I do want to start out with some housekeeping. Um, is this anyone's first time seeing the exhibit tonight? Oh, great. Thank you for coming by. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's always me. <laughs> Mic's on, but it's apparently in the wrong direction. Um, here, uh, do you, is Jenna up front? Can she? Well, this, that one. Uh, that's because yeah. I want two different sets of microphones. We'll do that one for now. We'll do this one for now. Uh, and thank you for letting me know. So um, I am Melanie Finlayson. I am the gallery manager here, but I had the lovely opportunity to curate this show um, because I also am a printmaker and have an MFA. And Cecily gave me this amazing opportunity and trusted me with that job. And I was really honored. Um, and this show, Pressing for Change, celebrates various ways that printmakers provide an accessible voice for change. Um, they also inspire action and explore relationships about community and land and environment. Um, and I'm just really grateful for our whole team here, everybody that helps with all of these things and events. And uh, so thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Katie, for monitoring tonight. And thank you to our team. We, all of our students work here. They're MSU students. And um, they are fantastic, and we couldn't do it without them. So thank you all. Um, we are the off-campus art center for MSU Denver, and we act as a resource for students and the broader community through co contemporary exhibitions. And um, we also have an immersive education program that came from, and a workforce development program. Um, I'd like to start this evening also with a land acknowledgement. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Center for Visual Art acknowledges the privilege that we have to gather in this place, once the territories and homelands of so many indigenous peoples, including the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and value the knowledge systems they have developed in relationship to their land. We understand that offering a land acknowledgement neither absolves settler colonial privilege nor diminishes colonial structure of violence at either the individual or institutional level. Land acknowledgements must be accompanied with ongoing commitments to displaced indigenous and immigrant communities. In order to learn more about the spatial relationships of indigenous communities to lands, we recommend visiting native-land.ca and exploring the interactive map. Um, so uh, just a few other things. Uh, CVA is connected to MSU Denver and supported by the university, um, but our exhibitions and additional programming are very much um, membership, is where membership is organization. And so if you don't know this, many students are going to be here tonight, hopefully. I know there were many that responded to me. You get free membership if you're an MSU student, so please do. You have to activate that. Our students up front can help you with that. If not, anyone else who wants to join at any other member level helps funds these free programs that we do, including Katie's programs as well. A um, couple other just things coming up with this show. Mo Print has so many amazing things happening, but we also have a few additional things, including an artist talk with Diane Fine and Mario LaPlante on February 29th. They are going to be joining remotely, but they have sent little takeaways and we will be live streaming it here. So feel free to still come to the event or join online. Uh, we also have Culture Club on March 20th, which is CVA's art making happy hour. Um, please register for these events online. And then Katie's Art and Action teens have an amazing uh, fashion um, show that's going to be happening on March 15th. And we also have a talk with Rick Griffith and a demo happening. And I didn't write the demo. Um, March 21st is what I think it is, um, but it's all online. And now I have the honor of introducing these amazing folks and having a conversation. We just have images running around in the background of all of their works and them in the studio. So Katie's going to monitor. We're just going to have a conversation and feel free to raise your hand and ask questions as we go. Great. 
Okay. Yes. All right. Do we want to try to use that mic again? Yes, I'm going to. I'll try. How is this any better? No, not any better. <laughs> I'm going to go up to it with that. I'll be right back. Okay. okay. Can you try? Thank you, Jenna. Ray, will you try this one here? Hello. Hello. Yeah. There we, go. we did test this Hello. earlier, but nothing goes as planned. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I think we'll just start by this one. passing these back. Yeah. yeah. So you, if you two want to share, then we can share. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So thank you for being here today. I'm excited to talk to these amazing artists and I hope everybody got a chance to look at them a little bit before you came here. Um, as Melanie said, there will be um, uh, slides running behind them so you can see more of their work. All right. So I would like to just start with some introductions. Um, so if you would, um, I would love to hear just just introduce yourself a little bit, give us a little bit of your background, um, and then uh, I think maybe the the printmaking process that you use because uh, you all have a, a slightly different process, even if you use some of the same materials. All right, we'll start with Karen. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I, I guess uh, would it. It's great to be here and a beautiful exhibition, so I'm really honored to be part of uh, this show. And um, my name is Karen Kuntz, and I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska, and I've been retired from teaching for uh, 40 years, not all of it at Nebraska, uh, but I taught printmaking all these years at University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Four years I've been retired, and 10 years ago, I started Constellation Studios in Lincoln. So I've got a print studio, collaborative uh, workshop site, uh, artist residencies, and I invite people to come, come see me in Lincoln. And um, that's good. What else was I going to say? And, and you're making me. Oh, my, well, I do it, as you can see yeah. them back here. We'll dive more deeply into it, <laughs> yeah. for sure. And, um, I print on uh, etching presses. I have about five presses at my studio. One is a custom made press, mm -hmm. but it can print the really large works. And uh, other ones, I use my brand press and I've got a Turkish press. So I'm press rich. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Right? Oh, there we go. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Ray Munoz. Uh, I'm a Denver-based artist, um, originally from Texas, but I've been here, up here since 99, so I'm here uh, to stay, I think. Um, I do a lot of stuff in the art community. Um, I run Alto Gallery, a part of Birdseed Collective. Um, I do stuff with uh, Moprint as well. Um, my, a big passion of mine is really uh, promoting the work that people are doing now, especially on a local level. Um, but as an artist, um, a lot of my work is photo-based because partly from promoting the art scene here, uh, they got me taking a lot of pictures and then that led to making art about those pictures. Um, but I'm also very, very much interested in nature. And so a lot of the work I do is also based on that too. Um, I'm a lino cut uh, relief artist. So uh, I draw on a piece of linoleum and I carve it out, the, the negative, and then I print it on either an etching press or by hand uh, with a spoon. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a, kind of one of the more simpler uh, ways of printing, but uh, I just get endless uh, joy and stress out of it. So. <laughs> uh, hello everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, John Hitchcock, um, I'm a Wisconsin-based artist. I'm originally from Oklahoma, and a lot of the work that I do revolves around going back home in Oklahoma, a lot in Fort Sill area, and it's just worked about that relationship to that space. Uh, my mother's side of the family is Kyle Comanche and my dad's German and Dutch from Michigan. So it's interesting to be living in the Midwest where my father's from and actually going home all the time, which I call Oklahoma home, Oklahoma. But the place and how that functions for me is really important. And I am a I'm a printmaker, I admit it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> However, I do um, 
work within the context of video and sound and somewhat performance and also a musician as well. And I teach at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, been there 23 years. So and we have a printmaking program, so it's pretty pretty good group of grads there and function and screen printing primarily and also relief is what I teach in installation arts. I do a lot of installation based work. Yeah. Who's next? Here we go. <laughs> Okay, so and I think we'll just kind of keep going down the line. Um, so if you would now talk about your the content of your work, so what your what your work is about, we know a little bit about your uh, your process, and we'll dive more into that for sure. Uh, but but give us some ideas of what what your work is about. Oh, usually it takes me an hour to wind up <laughs> to really get to <laughs> about to the point. Three five minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to take an hour. Uh, the Elevator speech is a uh, nature-based abstraction, um, but I have always been interested in the big question of how did things happen? How did things come about? How are the mountains raised? How are the canyons and plants and the kind of the unusual forms that are in nature? How do they look that way? So it really is kind of a generation question of, how did things come about? And that really suits my weird abstraction <laughs> because I'm making weird stuff too, which is what is in nature. Um, certainly landscape environment has always interested me and I'm from Nebraska and all of that open space and concepts about what happens on that land has really affected me. I saw it every day in my commuting life, driving across the landscape and what the farmers are doing and needing to be done, but also it could be destructive and we all know the effects of that now. So it has uh, had my work have a subtext about environmental issues and I want to make something really beautiful and alluring, but it draws you in and then there's all the other connotations that come about that I don't know at the beginning. So I find it through the making and then, um, so I have time to spend with the work while I'm making it and all these ideas start cropping up and suddenly my work is suggesting Michelangelo Sistine Chapel to me. <laughs> it's the same kind of tension of what happens when things uh, come together by chance and by design, by accident, by evolution by what we're doing to the environment. All of that makes these amazing, weird forms. Right, when you were talking about, especially your relationship to photography and the work that you do in the community, it occurred to me that you're, you're almost sort of a documentary artist. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, it was, so originally how it started was like, um, I had a friend that was starting a uh, kind of an online art blog and needed people to like write about shows. And so that's how I started. It's, it was really just going to different art shows and getting to know people, um, taking pictures of people interacting with the work, um, taking pictures of people creating the work as well, especially like mural artists. Um, and it just, I had, thousands of photos and it just seemed like kind of a waste to just put them on this little art blog and uh and i started making work that was based off of it um partly to document it but also partly um trying to figure out something more universal in the images so so that it's not just the person that's pulling tape off of, of a mural, but what does that really represent? Like, what does that say? Or like uh, the piece that's in here, um, where it's like some some people that are at a, at a, at a now closed uh, DIY spot called uh, Rhinoceropolis. That was just one night and I happened to be there and um, it actually shortly after the place closed, um for various reasons and so it, it just occurred to me that that was like important in a way to document but also like 
I saw like um, something bigger going on there and I didn't quite know what it was. And so I kind of sat on that image for a while until I decided to finally like make a print out of it. Um, and that's how it goes. Like just some images kind of stick in my mind for some reason or other um, because they have a sort of universal message that I'm, that's more interesting to me than, than just documenting what happened. Yeah. What was the question? I'm sorry. I'm, like, I'm lost. <laughs> uh, the question right now is about the subject matter of your work. So the okay. content and, and what it's about. All right. So the content, um, as I said earlier, I'm from uh, Lawton Fort Sill area. And so Fort Sill is the military base and it's the uh, largest field artillery training base in the United States. And so I've been, I grew up in that environment and that's hence the tank and the helicopters. And then you've got the relationship of the Wichita Mountains, which is a wildlife refuge that is adjacent to the military base. So State Highway 49 separates the, my family's land, which is Comanche uh, tribal land, from Fort Sill. And so they're both federal spaces. And so, and, and also the um, wildlife refuge is well a federal space. And so that relationship of it on a political level, but also on its pres preserving and the, the idea of preserving space and the idea of the military and its relationship of what it represents and stands for within a cultural perspective. If you say that the highest percentage of people that serve in the military, indigenous people that serve is a huge percentage, then that, that place is also known for uh, imprisonment, uh, uh, Geronimo of the Apache people, Sig Daide of the Kiowa people, and Quan Parker of the Comanche people were imprisoned and pushed to Fort Sill. So that was originally developed as an Indian Wars fort. So that relationship of where it started as a training post to a military complex to now the descendants of the people who were in prison there work there and working that environment also on that land. So a lot of the things I think about in my work are that reverence to the idea of space and land, but also the idea of the military and the service and the idea of veterans and how veterans with the indigenous culture are a very important component. And so I'm looking at that too and thinking about that. But then on the other end of it, there's that duality of that um, duality of the reality of how the military functions and within a war and such. It's kind of an event show. That's my elevator pitch. <laughs> okay, so the next round, um, we'll be talking about your process, right? And of course, um, process and content come together, right? So how the processes you use also create the content that you um, talk about. Okay, um, <laughs> it's hard to uh, describe it exactly, but everybody understands what a wood block is, right? Just carving on the wood and printing off of the relief surface, which is basically what I do. Um, but I think I have subverted some of the traditional ways that wood block has been done, especially color wood block. I don't necessarily use a separate block for every color. That would be laborious, a lot of carving. So I figured lots of shortcuts actually to use uh, probably mostly. These are done from two blocks. Both are reduced. So I print and carve and print and carve and print and carve until it arrives to the place that feels done. Uh, I don't have color sketches. I have thumbnail sketches and drawings, but uh, I'm not interested in knowing the colors ahead of time. So that is an evolutionary uh, trust that I have in the process. And um, I think other things that I've subverted is instead of putting the first color down over everything, I use a lot of uh, selective inking. I put ink in patches and use paper stencils so that it isolates the colors. So all of this actually, yeah, it's a technical thing, but it ends up being very much about the same thing I was talking about for content. It's an evolutionary process and I don't know what's going to come out from 
initiating something that literally I didn't know anything about. That's why I'm doing the process in the first place, to learn something about these images and how it happens. But it has a core in the oldest form of printmaking there is, the woodblock, very accessible. Um, I have big pieces of plywood in the studio. I'm not using uh, fancy wood. This is usually just birch plywood that I can carve with my hand tools. And um, I'm using oil base ink, but the ink emulates a lot of the qualities of the Japanese uh, block printing method, which we call mokuhanga now which just means block printing. <laughs> but, but that has come to mean a, a certain kind of aesthetic and technique. And I've blended that process from my influence from Asian art and also from Western art, from Europe and the German Expressionists. And it's a, truly a marriage that happens that has good emulation of those qualities from both sides. Tracy? Can, ask a question? Huh? Can you talk about how you apply the color to the black? Do you use a traditional roller method or how do you do that? Yes. I noticed some of your photos. I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I do use uh, just regular rollers. Speedball are my favorite right now. Cheapy little speedball rollers that have all their problems, but gosh, I can replace them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I use a lot of those. Sometimes I may have eight or nine colors out at one time and all those colors are in action. And um, once the ink is on the block, then I manipulate it further. So sometimes I'm blending things out. I'm using rags and wiping. And way back in the day, there were printmakers who said, you cannot do that. That's not allowed and uh, because it's like mono printing but actually I can control it and I kind of have my goal to be additioning because I'm doing all this work for heaven's sake I'm going to make more than one so uh, <laughs> I really need um, that kind of flexibility for how the ink can further be manipulated but it's not mono printing it's has a consistency that I'm studying what happens? What do I like? What choices? All those things come through proofing. Do you take expensive notes while you're printing? To no. Oh, no. <laughs> the stage is right then. I'm going to do it right then. Clean up later. <laughs> Can you speak to the softness? The what? The, the, just the softness of the way you apply the ink. I think people come in and as I've mm -hmm. shown it to other people, it, they say it feels like watercolor or colored pencil or something yeah. like that. Well, uh, most of my colors are very transparent. Sometimes they're 90% transparent base and a little bit of color. And when I apply the ink, I really stretch it really thin, apply it very thin, and then I can blend it out. Um, sometimes I blend it out into the nothingness of the paper. Mm -hmm. So the white of the paper and what is not printed really interacts with the ink and what is printed. So those that relationship is very interesting. But it's it's oil-based ink really stretched thin. <laughs> cool. Did you have a question? Question, as um, an artist as I've gotten more experience, I've actually loosened into my art. I'm curious if you feel you have gotten a little bit more um, tight with your experience or if you've loosened and that's brought about the change. Um, I, I know, I think that certainly over the years, the color sensibility has changed and grown. I think I used much more heavy or primary colors, so more intense, even though I think I'm doing the same things now, but the, the color sense is more sophisticated and and um, a lot more subtleties. Has it totally, I, I never worked representationally. This is the core of the, of the way I've always worked. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. But. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to tell because you're yeah. in it, right? It's, yeah. You know, what was your question? If you if you become more loose or more rigid mm -hmm. as you've, uh, I've become in. much more adventurous because I am learning constantly. This is why I'm 
starting them and is the learning of what can happen and what to do and I say I only use two blocks, but if I need a third, yes, I can go to a third block. It's only wood. <laughs> if I need to do monoprint, yes, I could do that. But I'm not hand coloring. I'm not doctoring them up that way. It's from the printing. So sorry, ask another question. And maybe this is for everybody who does the relief printing. Do you then also consider your wood blocks standalone like sculptural works after you've done carving them? Or do you really feel that the art is just the print? That's a dilemma. Everybody says they love the wood blocks. Right. Don't they? And I have them stacked up in the studio and they're beautiful and I'm using them for influence. But I don't think of them as the art, but I have made some as panels and some people even wanted to buy them. Well, that's good to get more things out the door. But, uh, <laughs> but actually the print is the thing. It has all the decision makings, all the stages are there. That's what I'm really after. And I'm not a sculptor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. So, so as a reminder, uh, process and how it informs the content. You, you've spoken to it a little bit already, but. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my process is, is pretty simple. Um, and it, I guess it really comes from uh, my somewhat from my background, my artistic background, I guess. Uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to be when I was a kid was a comic book artist. And so, uh, you know, illustration is just kind of comes natural to me, that certain style, that sort of line work um, is what's what I love doing. And um, that particular kind of printmaking, it, it's very graphic, it's very, wider black and uh, and it, it's very good for uh, having like a big big uh, impact in, a, in in just you know one color um, that being said I do like to see how much subtlety I can get out of it um, because it is so easy to just make something that's just like a punch in the face um, I don't always want it to be like that sometimes I want to see how soft I can make um, something. And, and there's different ways to do that, technically speaking, um, just with the carving alone. And then, you know, more recently, I've been learning more uh, techniques, printmaking techniques, like actually printmaking techniques, um, as opposed to just, you know, just inking it once and that's it. Um, so all of that comes into play um, I, I really enjoy the process of, of carving. Um, it's just, it feels good in my hand. I love that there's this sort of secret image as well from like in the chatter um, and that you can control that. You can have this, these extra textures and it's kind of, it's interesting. So like looking at other people's blocks too, seeing their decision-making in, the negative space that you don't see in the print. Because um, I can tell you a lot about the artists as well. You know, some people will just, you know, carve everything away in one direction. Some people will go in every which direction. Some people will get it down to almost the burlap, you know, like, um, and it, it's just kind of interesting like that. Um, but, uh, there's something I guess therapeutic about the slowness of it um, because it's it's a very labor intensive process um, and and you have to take your time with it and you have to be like very comfortable with your tools uh, and you got to let them be what they're do what they're made to do. Uh, sometimes you want to just use one tool and just get through everything or as much as you can with one tool. And then you end up, you know, making some wrong cuts or, or whatever, or cutting yourself, <laughs> um, which happens sometimes. Um, so I feel like I'm always, every print I do, I feel like I'm learning something new about the process, even if it's just like a really simple one. Um, and, and then just about design itself. Um, I really, as I, I think maybe from 
uh, from the photographer's perspective, I think about like white balance a lot. Um, and so in the in my designs, I really try to think of it in, in those terms, like, okay, I have this much black and this much white. How do I balance it out? Um, how, you know, how do I get that that mid-tone in there as well? Um, as well, like, and, and these aren't on display, but um, I like playing around with like ghost printing, for instance, as a technique um, for different reasons. Like one, I just think it's cool that you can just get more prints out of just, you know, uh, one block, one, one meeting. Um, but that, that now that gives you this other, um, this, this other context that you can play with. And alpha just like just this simple technique. And so now you, you can talk about time passing or or death or, or whatever the case may be. And you can use that as part of the design as well. Um, other thing about printmaking, of course, is like just the play in it. Um, like I, I don't really addition. Um, I, I started off that way because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. And then I just had a really hard time with it. I just got, it's like, okay, I gotta make another print. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, a lot of credit goes to people that can, that can do that and do something like that so consistently again and again. Um, but that being said, I really like to play around with my designs and reimagine them, use them in different ways, um, not be too precious about the print. Um, so in addition to like putting it on a wall in a frame, that's fine. That looks nice. But you can also cut it up and you can also fold them and you can turn them into books and you can turn them into business cards if you want, which I do. Um, it's just paper and it's just ink. And that's the fun thing about it. That's partly why I really love printmaking. Yes. You get really deep blacks, and I was wondering what your oh. <laughs> uh, for those ones, I think I, I think those are all soy based. Yeah, I think those are Oh no. Those ones um I those are kind of older prints. I think the way I'm printing now is better and more even. Um, but basically, I just used a lot of ink, and and I and I hit it a couple of times. And I, I think some of those too I did by hand with a spoon, um, which getting that deep black with a spoon is like. <laughs> so you you kind of have to. Lift the paper up, re-ink it a little, put it back down. Um, so, but I, I use the press a lot more now, so I don't really have that much of an issue, and I can get a better print off of it now, thankfully. With with your oops, oh yes, with your subject matter um, and using photographs that you've taken and sort of that are in your world. Is there, and it's such a long process, do you spend any of that time sort of thinking about what's going on in the photo and how it relates to your world? Or is, because I know you do a lot of work with the community as well. Are you, is that part of your process or is that gone by the time you're making prints? Oh yeah, I mean, the prints take so long to make. Um, you know, you, you might start off thinking like, I just love this image and I know I have to do it, I don't know why. But I'm going to do it. And in the whole process, because it might take months to do a to do a print, you learn more about it and you, you have the time to think about it. You have the time to really just get this image burned into your brain. Um, and that can be really powerful. And then when you see it out in the world, that too can kind of and you see like people interacting with it, people um, getting something out of it um, that goes uh, beyond like what I was intending to put out. That's the really special part. 
And, and John, would you talk about this work? But I'm also really interested to hear more about your more involved installations as well and how that all feeds into your practice. Technical component, you say? It's just great. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's simple. OK, that's it. There it is, got it. <laughs> um, I, I come from uh, also the background of additioning, too, and I feel like I split on. Makers Anonymous here, like yes, I did. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of auditioning in the past, but probably in graduate school there was a, a kind of a force to think about auditioning. And my professor Linwood Krennic at the time uh, was asking, "Can you make a really solid audition?" Because I wanted to try to do installation. And actually, uh, Karen Kuntz was one of our visiting artists in 1994. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, we had this conversation earlier, and I remember. And, and you gave me the idea of the thumbnail sketches, and that always stuck in my head. And and Linwood was about uh, making sure that we were able to handle our auditions. But on the other hand, he's like. You want to experiment and do these things you're talking about, which were I was calling them installations, and I was wanting to put objects on the ground on a blanket and break away from the flat surface. And much what Karen was saying about like how it's a monoprint really is all it becomes a monoprint because there's the fixed matrix that's kind of a component to that. But on the other end, there's all these objects that I'm printing on. So I was learning how to print on cylinders and learning how to print on fabric and and things that have been in the industry for years, but not in a kind of a, a art program teaching. So this was experiments for me. And so I moved into working on materials and I really enjoyed that process because the materials themselves can speak in a language of space and place. And so for me, that question earlier is what um, about the purpose of a print or the, what media you use, it's not important what medium or media I'm using, it's important that the idea is more present in the work. And so what does it take to get the image across is way more important than if I use silk screen or screen print or serigraphy, whatever you call it now. Or if I'm using, I don't use a lot of woodcut, but I've used it before, or if I'm using um, painting or drawing on it. And so a lot of the installations to me are large drawings that you come up with a drawing. And that notion of a drawing and how the drawing functions and using line and shape to convey a message, which is a larger space. And I think as a little kid, I was fortunate to be able to. Um, paint and draw on my walls. And so that was the beginning of working in installation as a, a little kid. So using the wall space and thinking in terms of how that works and then how I can bring imagery together was crucial. And so in this particular work, when I started this, I recycled a lot of works too, a lot of uh, paper as well as um, objects I previously printed on. This was part of about 250 pelt like shapes that I created for an exhibition. It was at the Rochebert Foundation in New York years ago, 2014 or 13. And I had these objects laying around and I, and I wanted to reuse them. And I started to pull them out and they were cut to a shape of a hide. And I started to, I already had screen printed X marks on them. And then I started to kind of place the star shapes on them. The X marks are in reference to that. They're a reference to keeping track. And the, they started originally when we invaded Afghan, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan in 2001. And so those images was when that be, I began to start using those X like shapes. But I was also looking at the involvement of how many people that died in war. So the X has a symbolic meaning in that. And then it also is re referencing the 50 year period of how many Buffalo had died. And so they then they become a reference to what happened in COVID, how many deaths there to currently current wars. So that's a reusable image that I've used over and over as a, a metaphor for uh, keeping track. And the word Thaiba, which is white person in Comanche, means keeping track. So oh. I'm part Thaiba. I'm, I'm white too. So I'm, when my mother cites the Namana, that's the Comanche people. So I've been thinking about that relationship of list maker is what and keeping track and what list maker means in the word dialogue. So that's another kind of message that's involved with it. 
And when I approach doing this, I don't, I, I see things too as how can I use a material to make it function? And I'm using paint markers or graffiti markers to draw the, the bead-like shapes and all those little circles that are happening are beadwork. Um, my grandmother was a beadwork artist. So as a little kid, I learned how to draw from her because she would have me look at the beadwork she was making and she would ask me to design patterns based on the patterns that she had was working on. Then she'd have me go outside and I would go outside and draw flowers, particularly rose, roses. And then I would come in, show the drawings to Grandma Gaku, and she would look at them and then she'd say, I want you to make something up <laughs> and use your imagination. So I would draw something and then she'd look at them and she'd say, what about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about, I'm like, this is, I'm learning critique. <laughs> My grandmother's giving me a critique. And so I'm getting theory, kind of color theory. She start, started talking about night colors and day colors in the relationship of the design pattern that I was mimicking or observational drawing. And then the imagination and this idea of how these work. And so I was learning drawing, like theory in a sense. So that I think about that when I'm working on, on the, the work I work on. Okay. Cool. Some of that color theory, is that reflected in here? Yeah, I'm thinking of day and night colors still. So like I said, the little dots, she would sometimes walk into the room and she would set her beads down and I would accidentally knock, she would have her medicine bottles, you know, those little medicine bottles that are full of beads and I knocked them down and she would, she would say something to me. And, and I knocked the beads all over the table. And I remember one time she just came in and threw the beads and scattered the beads on the table. And that stuck in my head. And that's how I see these dots or her beads on the table. But I also think about them as stars and the celestial and how that kind of functions too. So I'm looking at them as that as well. And so that pattern making and that looseness of that, and there was no she would always talk about the hidden bead too, like in, in bead work that there's nothing that's really ever complete and perfect, but there was always a bead you leave out. And that, that message of that leaving out component is the place where something can move in and out of. So it's not a spirit move in and out of, or thought, or a way of conversation. So you have room for growth so that it's not only one point of view, that there's multiple point of views. And so that was another learning thing, something that she said that that stuck in my head as a little kid. Melanie, remind me, are we going to 6.30 or 7? 6.30. 6.30. Ah, so we're almost there. All right. <laughs> um, I think let's just go through and um, if you could talk to us sort of about like what's on your horizon, what's next, um, what, you're, what you're thinking about in the, for the future. <laughs> well, you might have seen one uh, slide go through by here a big stack of prints. <laughs> I'm working on a commission, uh, an additional 250, <laughs> which is something I have. Speaking of additions. Yeah, do, I, <laughs> uh, do I need to do it? I kind of wanted to. It's for the Cleveland Museum of Art Print Club, and uh, they're one of the longest print clubs in the country that have worked with artists way back for 75 years or so. So lots of big names are in there and a lot of unknowns also. And it's a nice commission to work on this year. And um, I don't know what else I'm going to do other than uh, just talking with Brian Curling about an exhibition plan that we want to cook up about borders. Hmm. So I like to curate shows once in a while. I do it at the studio also, but uh, this one could be at the studio and also travel. So it's in the in the back of my mind that's working on. Karen, I'm just curious how if you think pretty much about your book work in the same way that you describe thinking about your books. Mm. Uh, I think that the book works, <clears throat> Carrie, I, I've always had a practice of doing artist books along with my prints ever since graduate school. So it's been a long time of long interest 
And I think they address very much the same things as the prints, but they say it in a longer voice because they're more images. Um, they have a different format. Uh, they have tactility and the physicality of the book. So they really, uh, again, a way to kind of violate the print. I get to touch those prints. They're meant to be touched. And uh, you're handling the paper and seeing what the ink is like. So it augments what I do with the prints. And often I'm doing woodcuts in those uh, as well, sometimes etching. And uh, often I find a text that goes along with the book. So then here's somebody else's voice that's saying something so wonderful that's more than what I could say. Uh, I try to say that visually, but to find just the right text to go with the artist books is really a, an a, a expansion of what I'm doing, I think. Uh, yeah, coming up, quite a bit coming up. Um, so, a uh, month of printmaking, Denver's month of printmaking uh, is is uh it's it's in effect but really march is like the big month there's there's all kinds of things happening um i'm very lucky to be involved with that um organization uh helping out with uh different things but the big one is print jam so that's something that i encourage everybody here to come to it's going to be at the arvada center march 16th and we'll be uh demoing a bunch of different kinds of printmaking um, in a really beautiful show setting. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I'm co-organizing that with Brady Smith and Aaron Jones. And so please come out and support that. Uh, other than that though, there's, you know, different shows. Uh, I'm working on a solo show uh, that's gonna be at Leon Gallery uh, opening April 6th. So I'm working on two crazy pieces, which, <laughs> um, I think I previewed a couple images in, in there. Um, so um, I hope I can finish those. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back get back to that when I when I finish here. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's just all kinds of cool things happening in Denver, and um, I'm really, really grateful to be a part of it. Cool. Um, upcoming Hamilton Woodtype. I'm going to Hamilton Woodtype in Two Rivers to do a series of works on horses. I've been using, I'm going through their archives and looking at the images of horses, and I'm using that with words, the Comanche words. It's the Comanche word for horse, and so I'm kind of learning about language too at the same time, also looking at these images that are there. and. In addition to that, I'm doing, I've done a whole series on horse masks right now that's traveling and it's going to be at the Tweed Museum coming up in the Loop and it's currently at the Mauser Museum in Louisiana. And what else? We've got a show that was, uh, the, 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 one of the installations that was up that had very similar imagery is at the uh, National Gallery in Washington, D.C. and it's traveling to Connecticut, the uh, New Britain Museum. So I'm getting ready to go there, I think next month to install that and get that ready. And so installing that is also a process of, all those are cut prints. So those were already previously printed and they're mainly square prints, they're cut to shape and they're gonna be installed directly on the wall. Oh, music. So I'm a cinema musician and the video in this piece, uh, this artwork, there is actually two videos playing. One of them is a story. So when you get a chance and that's playing and come back to the gallery and that's up, there's a story I'm telling and it's a story my grandmother told me and there's other stories she's told me and there's also situations that I've occurred, unique situations that I've with my cousins. And so I told those stories recorded them and then our, the band I play in, we created a music, sort of a, a whole piece around each story. So we're releasing an album coming probably the end of this, probably May is the plan, Blanket Songs. It accompanies the actual body of work that's out there already, but this music's gonna be released soon too. 
And so I'll, I'll have I have my website's hybrid press and there'll be links on it too. But there's music out there already of another album that we did that has pedal steel, lap steel guitar, regular guitar. There's other things, but that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> It does look like we have time for, sorry, this is delay on here. It does look like we have time for a couple more questions. Are there any questions that haven't been asked yet? <laughs> wow. Well, that's another one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, two of you have said that you're specifically teachers and for a moment you said that you do demos. Do you like to teach the type of printmaking that you do or do you have a preference of teaching something else that you don't do every day for your own art well i've been a generalist printmaker as the teacher all these years and i taught everything uh, primarily um, i like teaching etching woodcut and i'm okay with lithography screen print not so great either but i've done it all and you kind of have to know these things and sometimes just teaching those media make me want to do it too so i have uh, done etching continually all these years not on the scale of the wood blocks but um, but that's been an interesting thing to keep developing as well but you know that's the way you learn more if you're teaching the students can be all these experimenters and make all the problems. <laughs> it's really interesting to keep pushing those through having all these uh, models with the students. All right. So how do I answer this? I teach screen printing and relief advanced class and I work with graduate students and I do uh, interdisciplinary critiques and conversations and Teaching has changed way a whole lot over the years. That's, a, that's like a panel of, of crazy yeah. itself. <laughs> and the process I primarily love to do is screen printing. And the, the class I love teaching a lot is intro relief. That's of the magic that happens. And the kind of colors, like I always see peering through the different colors. I'm like, oh, I wish I could do that because mine get all muddy and it just doesn't happen right. And you throw the stencils and it's like, it's just right. Then my students do it and I'm always surprised. I'm like, wow, like you did it. <laughs> That's like, wow, I mean, I can't do that. It's just amazing. And, and so that expectation of what you show them and what happens and the magic they create is always empowering. And I love that feeling every time that someone surprises me with something I didn't expect. And I, I really appreciate dimensional work too. And so when you were talking about blocks, I, I encourage students to use those in their work, make it about the object, make it about your thing, whatever the intent of your meaning is more important than worrying about only the process. And I think that's a, a methodology that we're, we're in a different generational space that we don't have to we're making lives and will live. It will continue to live, but the reality of, of some of the techniques, there needs to be a survival component to those two. And having that ability to bring those together and think in an artistic way, but also know that the technique has to be there to make things work right. So it's important. But I love teaching. I've been doing it for 23 years in Madison and three years before that in Minnesota. So it's, it's, it's like I said, I've been in grad school my whole life. <laughs> we have 53 grads, so it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of stuff. Yeah. This is actually a question that fits on that for Ray. Um, so I know that you work a lot with curating exhibits. It's the same kind of thing. How much at all does your curating experience in the form of studio work and vice versa? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it all kind of gets in there, and and it, it, I'm I'm I guess exposed to so many different artists and so many different kinds of art. Um, and putting shows together, like um, it all kind of blurs together, honestly. Um, it just because I've been doing it for like ten years now, so. Um, 
but it definitely uh, it makes its way into the work, I think, in some ways. Um, how exactly? I guess it depends on each piece. Um, but there's that. Um, how would I put it? It's it's a different beast. <laughs> it's a different beast. Um, curating, I guess. OK, here's the thing. Curating is more about um, taking other people's work and really, really letting it shine, doing everything you can to make sure that their work shines. Um, and, and whatever that means, whether it's like the way you hang the show, the, the whether how you have pieces talk to each other, um, the different contexts you bring out of them. Um, and so in some ways curating, I feel is like a, a selfless <laughs> act because it, it's so much work. Um, and so many curators I know are very talented artists. And it's like they step back so that they can allow other people's uh, to, to really shine. Um, and and when I am in artist mode, it's like I have to remind myself like, oh wait, now it's my time to step forward. Now it's my time. Uh, like I can't just shrink back and just let everybody else. Like now, now I have to like, um, be in touch with like what I'm about, what what's important to me, uh, and describing like um, you know what I'm feeling. Um, but definitely having all those people in my head, all those different experiences, uh, it definitely does influence me. Yeah. It's interesting how that is like teaching, you know, letting other people shine and then stepping back, and you know. Doing your own. Yeah. Right. One last question. So my question is, how do you think the guy would affect your <coughs> just because now it's more as we can talk with very understanding. My question is like what technology is so Mm, OK, so I'll repeat that. So the question is about AI uh, in relation to, you know, something that's so handmade, right? Um, and how it relates um, and what you've been. That's a, that's a great question to ask after we're over time. <laughs> so very quickly. <laughs> it's so new, I don't quite know uh, what the ramifications will be. Uh, I've always prided myself on trying to stay ahead of all my imitators and all the other people out there, so I have to get weirder and weirder. Uh, I don't want uh, AI to take my works. Just don't ask them to look for me. <laughs> AI. And um, I just think the big fear I always have is that the satisfaction everybody will have with the lesser than choices, the digitalized choices, the non-human choices will replace reality. And pretty soon we don't need elephants anymore. They're all on the video somewhere. So um, it could be the same thing with this. You know, we don't need artists. We don't need the creative thinkers because a machine can do it. Although they do a generic version and hopefully people will come to where they need what we're made for, what our hands are for, the physicality of relating with real things. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, it, the thing is like um, the stuff that, that that's AI is producing, uh, you're seeing it on generally like your phone or your computer monitor. And that's just not how you see this work, you know, that's none of that is ever going to produce the same effect as coming over here and looking at the quality of, of John's pieces. 
you know, or, or looking at how the color really looks in Karen's pieces. Um, you can't replicate that. Like that's that's just something that's and and because printmaking is not a perfect process. Even if you're really really good at editioning, they're all a little different. And that's like kind of the really beautiful thing about printmaking too is that, um, you know, that that they are still unique. So I grew up with that a lot. Actually, this morning I was working on the iPad. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> because my students can speak together. And they're like, every time I walk into my advanced print class, everyone has an iPad. And they're like using their little pencil and drawing. Procreate. Procreate. Yeah. Procreate to replace Photoshop. <laughs> but you need Photoshop to make the transparency. So it didn't. So I'm like, OK, this. It doesn't make sense. So we make all our little drawings on Procreate with their hand drawing, which I love it. I'm like, that's awesome. Yay, draw more. And then they throw a photo in and they draw over them. Like, okay, they, do they do it. We produce the images. They put them in a screen and then they print them with ink and it's it totally transports them into something else. So I'm actually experimenting with that personally right now. However, I feel I have a colleague who's also in this exhibition, Emily Arthur, Professor Arthur. Emily is all about hand painting and hand drawing. So she has them before they come to me and they have skills with doing washes and hand drawing on mylars. And then Professor Abdewala uh, Faisal, he also he uses bitmap and, and Photoshop and all those techniques too. So when I get the advanced students, they're kind of two spaces and it's a unique place because we're still using traditional methods to advance those ideas. Then I go to a graduate critique or a graduate thesis defense, and they use chat GPT to write their artist statement and make a video about it. They did it on purpose to talk about the nature of what technology is doing. And they put glitches in it purposefully to show that they, did ChatGPT do this or did I do this or what? And, and so we're at this unique stage of this conversation. At least artists are really considering, you know, young contemporary artists are thinking about what it does and how does that function and where are we going with it? And, and I feel I agree too with the hands involvement is crucial for us in certain survival as makers because we're seeing the virtual galleries. Is that where we're going and what, what does that mean? And I think that we still have this need for unity. We still have this need to have this conversation. We still have this need to breathe the same air. Even though when the air was not breathable, we still wanted to be in the same room with each other. And I think that's the place as existence as people, we strive for that. And I think that's where we're, we, for us to survive, we have to retain that. And I think hands-on use is crucial. All right, thank you so much. Um, so uh, we'll be around for a little bit if you have more questions, um, but thank you. <laughs>